Send the light. Oh, boy. It's been a while since we've uh, really sang out on that one. <laughs> some of the older songs kind of get hidden away as we entertain some new music, but it's good to uh, go back to the old hymns as well. Welcome, each one of you, to today's service. Such a good-looking crowd out there. I wish I was a mirror and could reflect you instead of what I have, but, you know, we're stuck with what we're given. <laughs> Would you stand with me? Our precious Heavenly Father, with joy we come before you today, thankful for the many blessings that you've given us. It is so good to be in the house of your, in your house today, Lord, and we pray your blessings down on each one of us as we worship you in spirit and in truth. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Remain standing for this is my father's world. Consider all the words thy 
start this off right. Good morning. As a reminder this morning, we have our ushers to help guide us down the outside aisles as we come down around the table. And then if you will, return to your seats uh, through the middle line. And uh, if you want or would like any assistance, just let one of the ushers know and they'll be glad to help. I'd like to start this morning with a question. How do you recognize change in your life? Can you see or you, can you recognize it as it actually happens? Or is it something you can only see in your rear view mirror, see the results of it? As we come to the end of a school year and for some a graduation, it might make us think back to the changes those events made in our lives, how it changed our life. Was it a major change or was it just another day? Winston Churchill, back in the autumn of 1942, spoke about a major battle they'd just been through for Britain. And as a parent, you might look back at the completion of a school year and a graduation as maybe a major battle. But Churchill said about the results, now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. But it is perhaps the beginning it, the end of the beginning. Think back to a time in your life when everything changed. Certain events, individual relationships, do things regarding our health and our happiness can change our lives forever. Just the other day I thought back to what I believed was a minor decision or a minor change in my life. But instead that, cha that decision changed my whole life. Back in 1980, before there was an Apple and before there was a Microsoft, I went to my first computer training class, mainly because nobody else wanted to, and the second is nobody else would go. But I did. And that one simple decision completely changed the course of my career and my life. One might even say that one event set the course and the path for why I'm here today in this church this morning. Some changes are good. You marry the girl or guy of your dreams. You got the job or the promotion that you'd been hoping for. A child was born and you knew your life would never ever be the same again. But not all changes are happy. That beautiful marriage could become plagued with bitter conflict or even end in divorce. Instead of getting that job you wanted, you might lose the job you have and with it your self-esteem and, and a loss or a fear of what the future might hold. That child whom you would gladly give your life for may become with, with it, may get a serious illness or be born with a handicap or choose to go down a path that breaks your heart. All of us have experienced events that's changed our life. Just in the time we've been talking here this morning, some of you may have had certain changes in your lives come to mind. We live in a culture that seems to be searching desperately for a better life. At the same time, it refuses to embrace the changes that could make that better life possible. In a reality show, most some of you might remember, called Intervention, it, they pictured real-life situations of people with addictions and confronted them of the with the destructive be their destructive behavior and at the same time offered resources to turn their life around. But amazingly, the person living with the addiction fights the offer of help. They appear to be afraid of what a new life without the addiction might look like. There was once a poster that focused on the Lord's Supper. It pictured a loaf of bread and a cup of wine. 
But it was the caption below the picture that spoke volumes for what the Lord's Supper really represents. It read, to believe in God is to believe that tomorrow can be different from today. Despite the denial, isn't it the message that a lost world wants to believe in? We know it's true. We can see the desperate search, even when it's in all the wrong places. Our culture seeks fulfillment in many things. Some are clearly destructive. Drugs, alcohol, gambling, for example. Others look for more acceptable outlets, such as a job or money, power or fame. But none of these venues can fulfill our deepest needs. Our scriptures tell us why. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, the world and its desires pass away. So do we really want to make a change in our lives, change today? Can we accept today Christ and he can make those changes real in our life? If we really want our life to count for something, it, ha it has to be something eternal. And that's the hope Jesus offers us. The Lord's Supper reminds us that Jesus did not see himself defined by the pleasures of this world. You may say, sure, it was easy for him. He knew what the future was ahead. And that's true. Jesus had the advantage of seeing what was ahead an advantage you and I can't even comprehend. But does it make sense to reject the lesson just because Jesus could see further than we can? Why not instead decide to accept his understanding, not just of eternity, but his vision for us and what we can be? To the historian, the Last Supper was about death. But for us, it's truly about living and life. Jesus' resurrection for sure, but also our life. As we come around the table this morning, a small change in our thoughts, our focus, could bring new value and purpose to our life. Perhaps this is the end of our beginning. Today, right now, our lives can change forever. All we must do is to imagine that it's possible. And remember, to believe in God is to believe that tomorrow can be different from today. Here we practice an open communion. If you have been born again through the living and enduring word of God, we welcome you to join us in our communion this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the many blessings you have given us. From this beautiful day to this church, our friends and our family that we enjoy. We pray for continued strength of our faith. Help us to recognize changes in our life and to see those changes as part of God's much bigger, greater plan. And use that change to strengthen our faith in you even more. I pray you will watch over our congregation. Keep it safe and secure and close to your heart. As we encounter difficulties in our lives, help us to gain the peace, the contentment, and the patience that comes from knowing and following Jesus. We are thankful for the grace that sent your son for us. Help us to walk in a way that will always honor and glorify him. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Let's all rise for the reading of God's word. Okay, I'll be reading Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters, refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for your uh, holy scripture. We thank you for this very comforting chapter that it's read so many times. Father, be with our brother this morning as he uh, brings a message to us that we may be blessed and serve you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. this time I'd like to uh, introduce Brother Dave Armstrong as our speaker today. Good morning. My name is Dave Armstrong and with me this morning also is my wife Velva and our friends Kirk and Tammy who are from Washington, Missouri. And uh, I was the senior minister at the Christian Church there in Washington for about 26 years. We finished that up at the end of 2020, and uh, now my wife and I are part of a ministry called Pastors Beyond that provides pastoral care for missionaries on the mission field. So we still live in Washington, and then we travel from there to visit missionaries on the field or also through uh, just online to provide pastoral care to help them remain spiritual, spiritually healthy so they can continue on the field and their ministries as well. So. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today and to be able to come and share God's word with you. Uh, you know, um, so we're going to be looking at Psalm 23, so if you want to turn there and have that ready, that'll be, uh, that'll be great. It'll be especially focusing on one phrase there uh, out of that psalm today about the dark valley, because dark times do come in, in all of our lives. Each and every one of us go through those dark times. There was a mom putting a little one down for bed on a summer evening. And when those uh, summer thunderstorms was rolling through, it was getting kind of dark, and uh, the thunder was loud, and the lightning was flashing, and she had a prayer with, uh, with him, began to turn out the light, and she did it in the darkness. His little voice with a quiver said, Mom, would you sleep with me tonight? And she said, Oh, honey, you know I can. I, I need to go sleep with Daddy. It just took a second for him to say, The big sissy. <laughs> We've all been the big sissy at times. And the storms and the dark times and the darkness. And David knew what that was like as well. Of course, we know that David wrote Psalm 23, and he experienced the dark times in his life as well. So I want to focus this morning on that phrase there, beginning with verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. We go through a lot of different kinds of dark valleys. Most translations, when we're used to the valley of the shadow of death, sometimes it's translated the, the dark or the darkest valley here in Psalm 23, and Sandy mentioned a lot of those this morning that we experience, that we go through at different, different times. It can be, can be the dark valley of, of addiction. It can be in the valley of shadow of death, dealing with grief of someone that we, that we love and that we so dearly miss. We don't talk a lot. Maybe we should talk more about mental health and church gatherings, but anxiety, depression, things that many of us wrestle with, dark valleys that we have to go through are one that we love goes through. It might be a pain that you face, and you know it's there today, and it's going to be there tomorrow, it's going to be there the day after that, and just, that's just this side of heaven, it's not going to go away. Maybe it's a friend who turned their back on you, maybe you've been bullied. It comes in a lot of different, a lot of different ways, but we go through times of dark valleys. The Bible talks about lots of valleys that we go through. Hosea talked about um, the valley of trouble, and Joel talks about the valley of decision, and Psalm 84 talks about of the valley of weeping. So we go through a lot of dark valleys in our life. And again, so did David. So I'm going to ask you to kind of help me out here for a minute this morning, and you don't have to. If you don't, I'll feel a little silly, but that's okay. I've felt silly many times before. But what kind of dark valleys did David go through in his life? Now, I probably wrote Psalm 23 
probably early in his life, but true throughout the course of his experience. So just as you think about David's life, what you've read about in Scripture, just kind of holler out for me. Let us know what are some of the dark valleys that David went through in his life. Anybody? The loss of his infant son? Yes. After the sin of Bathsheba and the newborn died and how difficult that, that was. Obviously, we read about that in Scripture. And again, many of you have gone through the loss of a child, you know, whether a newborn or a miscarriage or a grown child. You know the, the darkness of that valley. What else in David's life? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. King Saul was chasing him, and uh, he said he's one step from death on the run in the wilderness, hiding in the caves. And then just last week, didn't just last a year, but for years, he went through that dark valley. What else? What about that really tall fellow he went up against? Goliath. Yeah, we know that story, don't we? And that literally was a valley, the Valley of Elah, and the Valley of the Shadow of Death, but God delivered him through that. He knew the Lord was with him through that valley as well. There's a place called Ziklag where he and his men spent a considerable amount of time and got so bad that his own men wanted to stone him and kill him in that time. So there's a lot of dark valleys. I think, I guess my guess would be maybe the darkest would be when his grown son Absalom turned on him, wanted to kill him and take over the throne. Remember that story? He had to a, had a flee from Jerusalem on the run. And then his son Absalom was killed. He died before they had a chance to reconcile him how that broke David's heart. Maybe that was the darkest time in his life. He went through a lot of times like that. He did. But he held on to that truth. He read in the other Psalms that David wrote. We know that it's true, that he knew that the Lord was with him through the valley of the shadow of death, through the darkest valleys of life. He would fear no evil, for his shepherd was with him, and he's with us as well. So this morning, there's just a, a couple of main things I want to bring to our attention to help us through these dark times, the dark valleys, the valley of the shadow of death. And the first thought is this, to trust that he allows the dark valley for our growth. Trust that he allows the dark valley for our growth. He is still leading us even when we're in the dark valleys. We, we read there in Psalm, 20, Psalm 23 that he, he leads me, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, right? And that is true in every path that he leads us down, even in the dark valleys, he is allowing that, and he still continues to guide us and to lead us through the dark valley that we can continue to grow in our relationship and grow in our faith. I'm going to be reading from James chapter 1. If you want to turn there, you can do that. It might be up on the screen. Actually, it's going to be. You can read it from the screen. And ask, I'm going to read it out loud. And if you can see it, if you want to, let's read it out loud together. From James chapter 1, this screen, there'll be another one right after that, verses 2, 3, and 4. Read it together. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. To welcome those times, to see God's hand at work in those times, even through the dark valleys, the valley of the shadow of death, we use those trials to help us grow in our faith and our perseverance. It says in Psalm 78, toward the very end, at the very end of that psalm, that, that God took David from tending the sheep to shepherding his people, and that he shepherded them with integrity of heart and skillful hands. And it sounds like a simple, short journey. He took him from tending the sheep to shepherding God's people. But we know, even as we've talked about already this morning, it was not a short journey, and it was not a simple journey. It was very difficult as he walked through those dark valleys and through those times that tested him, that stretched his faith, his trust in God, to believe what God was doing in his life, that God had a plan. And God needed that so he could lead God's people with integrity of heart and with skillful hands. And he's still working that in our life as well. Let's read some more verses. This comes from 1 Peter chapter 1. Again, it'll be up on the screen, so let's read it out loud together. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. When we're in a dark valley, 
it can feel like it's going to last forever. It's like that there's no end. But we just read in 1 Peter 1, tested though now for a little while. It will pass. It's just for a season. Now, there's many times when what God thinks is a little while may not be what I think is a little while. Can I get an amen for that? Been there? Yeah, been there. But God says for a little while. That season will pass. That dark valley will pass. And when it does, we will grow. Our test will be made more genuine and our, our testimony for the Lord uh, stronger because we've gone through that time as the Lord led us. So I understand that he allows these times that I can grow, but I still need to cooperate with him so that I can spiritually grow. God has a plan in this. The shepherd is leading me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake that he might be glorified through my life. But I need to cooperate with him. And so the things we're going to talk about in the next few minutes, they're not going to be new to you. They're reminders of basic things, simple things, but important things that we cooperate with God as he leads us through the dark times so that we can grow spiritually to bring him glory and praise and become more mature in our life. So the first thing is simply this, taking the next step. Just keep taking the next step. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, right? That brings to our mind the idea of walking. It's a path. That's what we walk that. We follow. And as a shepherd leads us, we need to continue taking one step at a time. And may, they may just be as simple as saying, Lord, help me through today. Help me through this decision today. What's the next thing? I may not be able to see next week. I may not be able to see next year. But what is it today? What is that's right in front of me? What needs to be, got, be done right now? Help me do the next thing with you, for you. The New Testament talks about keeping in step with the Spirit, walking with the Spirit. And we think about Psalm 119, 105. The, uh, right, uh, the God's word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, right? As we step with the Spirit, and keep in step with him. That Sometimes that light is just right in front of us for the next step. But that's enough. He's leading me down this path, even through the dark valley. But I need to continue taking that step. Lord, what is it today? And what is it today? And what is it in this decision? What is it in this relationship? What is it in this hour? One step at a time that I continue to walk with him down that path. And then pray. And that's the one we know. But I especially want to encourage you to pray, especially to pray the Psalms. To make a habit of praying the words we find in Scripture, written by David and others, as they went through their life experiences. You'll find in the book of Psalms, prayers, words that God has given to us for every, every imaginable situation, emotion that we'll find ourselves in through the course of life. And I find myself often going to the Scriptures and going to the Psalms and reading through and praying those together. One fellow that I read a while back put it this way. This isn't word for word, but it's pretty close. You'll get the idea. He said that God seems intent on giving us the words not only uh, to fill out our thank you notes, but also our complaint forms. Have you ever had one of those times when you've got something inside of you, but you just can't find the words? And it might be that you're incredibly happy. You're just so full of joy. Or it might be that you're very anxious. It might be that you're scared. It might be that you're angry, even bitter. And the feelings are inside of you. And Lord, I feel this, but I just, I just don't have the words. Well, God gives us the words for those prayers in the Psalms. Whether we're rejoicing and celebrating or whether we're pouring out our hearts to him in sadness or in pain. Uh, the, the writers of the Psalms demonstrate great spirituality, but also great humanity and vulnerability there. And so we go to the Psalms and we read and we use those for our prayers to connect us back. Because it just not only reminds us of God's word, but it reminds us who God is and what God is like. And we need that as we go through the dark valley. So I really want to encourage you to spend time, swim in the Psalms this summer. Read through those and let those be the foundation for your prayers in every life situation. Manage your mind. And a lot of different ways we could talk about this, to manage our mind as we go through these dark valleys. And that way we're cooperating with the Lord. Singing is one way to do that. We love the song service this morning. They did a great job leading us through that. Love the, the lyrics of the hymns and the truths that are there. But it's a way of coming back to the Lord and focusing our thoughts where they need to be, on, on, on the Lord where they need to be through the difficult times. Maybe at one time in 
in your life. For another, you've, you've heard of a, a lady named Kay Arthur. She's written many Bible studies, and maybe you've even gone through one of her Bible studies. I want to read you some things that she wrote. She said, if you're God's child by covenant, a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the truth you must cling to when you feel abandoned. You are inscribed on the palms of his hands. For the feelings are just that, feelings. Feelings that are very real, feelings that you must deal with, but remember reality. Reality is the fact that a covenant has been cut on your behalf. Your feelings will betray you, overwhelm you, cripple you, if you do not decide by the gut-level determination of faith that, feel it or not, you will trust your covenant God. Put on the music, the hymns of faith, the choruses of trust. Sing whether you feel like it or not. Sing whether you can sing or not. Sing until your feelings conform to reality. I like that last line. Sing until your feelings conform to reality. Feelings come and go. And you can't really do a lot about how you feel. They just, God made us that way and they happen. But singing the truths, spiritual truths, help bring our feelings back to where they conform to reality. Memorizing scripture, meditating on scripture is another great way to manage our thoughts, cooperate with the Lord through the dark valleys and the tests in our life. Romans chapter 8 tells us that uh, the mind set on the spirit brings life and peace, right? The mind set on the spirit is life and peace. And by memorizing God's word, hide it in our heart, meditating on that, thinking about that, we find the peace and the direction of the Lord that we need through those difficult times. And you can find different verses for different life experiences, for different situations that you're in, and graft those into your life that bring about different fruit. Maybe you need patience. Maybe you need joy. Maybe you need forgiveness. Maybe you need hope. And different verses in the scriptures can help bring about and bear that fruit in your life. You know, I read about a guy in the United Kingdom over in England who had one apple tree with 250 different kinds of apples. Because through the years, he's grafted different branches from different apple trees onto this one tree. And as you pick out different scriptures from the Bible about different situations, different needs, and graft those into our life through meditation and memorization, they grow the spiritual fruit that we need in our life, different things for different situations, for different people. But I encourage you to make use of that as well. Again, I know the things we're talking about right now, there are things that you know, things that we've heard, but sometimes that's all we need. Sometimes in the middle of things, we don't need something new. We just, we just need a reminder of some of the basics. When, when you're in the middle of the ball game, when you're up at the plate, and the coach says, keep your eye on the ball. He doesn't need to come in and teach you a whole new swing. It's just a reminder, the basic, keep your eye on the ball. When you're in the middle of the concert, the director says, now don't rush, don't rush. You're not learning a new song, but just a reminder of something basic, but something important. That's what we need, and that's what these things are for us as well. Choose your thoughts. Philippians 4.8, a verse that's familiar to us. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, let your, your mind think about such things. Isaiah 26.3, he will keep in perfect peace all those whose minds are steadfast on him because they trust in him. Set on our thoughts where they need to be, cooperating with the Lord as we go through the dark valleys. You know, when I go through difficult times, whether it can be fear or anxiety, whether it be a temptation, I can find that I can get into a tug of war with those thoughts. You know, if I take a big old thick rope and I toss it out there to you and you grab a hold of that end and I grab a hold of this end and I tug, what are you going to do? You pull back, don't you? And so I pull harder and you pull harder until finally I'll get worn out and I'll cross that line. Sometimes we approach challenges in our life, temptations in our life, difficult situations in our life, and that way we focus on it so much, it's like a tug of war. I'm, I'm going to overcome it. I don't want to do that. I need to get around that. And the more I tug on it, the more it tugs on me. But these things we've talked about in the last five, seven minutes or so are ways that I think of, of just letting go of that rope, just letting go of it and putting my mind somewhere else, on the Lord, through song, through prayer, through scripture, through thinking of healthy, wholesome, noble thoughts through thanksgiving, 
Rather than playing tug of war with that anxiety, with that, with that fear, with that uncertainty, just dropping the rope, putting my focus, my attention on the Lord so I can continue to take one step after another down that path. As he leads me in the paths of righteousness, even if that path takes me through the dark valley. Another thing I want us to think about this morning in the time that we have is this thought. Believe I'm not alone in the dark, in the dark valley. Number one was to remember that he allows it for my growth. But the second thing this morning is this. Believe that I'm not alone in the dark valley. When you go through a dark time, and I don't know you, but there's enough of us here today that I feel pretty confident there's somebody here in the middle of a dark valley today, if not many of us, but you're not the only one. I just want to remind you of that today. You're not the only one. You're not the only believer who goes through the dark valley. We all go through them. And Satan would like to make us think that we're all alone. Satan likes to make us feel isolated, that we're the only one, but it's not true. Psalm 88 in your Old Testament was written by a man named Heman. Heman was one of the, in fact, the first of three Levites that David appointed in charge of the worship music in the house of God. Served David and even, even Solomon in many ways. He was a grandson of Samuel. He was incredibly wise. He wasn't as wise as Solomon, but one place the Bible says that Solomon was even wiser than Heman. So to be even in the same comparison for Solomon, he was a very wise fellow from a spiritual family, gifted musically, uh, deep spiritually. And he wrote, or at least co-wrote, Psalm 88. And it is, by many people's opinion, the darkest psalm in the Bible. The last line of Psalm 88, maybe take some time to read it this afternoon. Psalm 88, the last line, you've taken from me friend and neighbor, darkness is my closest friend. And that's the end. In fact, in the Hebrew, the word darkness is the last word of that psalm. Darkness is my closest friend. Here's Heman, a spiritual man, talented, gifted, wise, trusted, responsible, and in the midst of a very, very dark time in his life. And I just want to share that with you to let you know that you can be a spiritual person. You can love the Lord. You can be faithful. You can be serving you can read your Bible and pray and still find yourself in a very dark valley, sometimes for a very long time. And that you're not alone. And that does not mean that you have sinned. It does not mean that you are broken. It does not mean that God is angry with you. We all find ourselves there at times. And at least for me, I hope for you, just knowing that can be a help. I'm not the only one. It doesn't mean that God is mad at me. It doesn't mean that I'm broken. Jesus went through dark valleys. And if I'm going to be made in the image of Christ, God is going to have to lead me through some of the same experiences that he went for Christ's likeness to be formed in my life as well. We need to encourage one another through those dark times. The Apostle Paul went through times like that, didn't he? I think it's 2 Timothy chapter 1 and chapter 4. You know, his last letter, 2 Timothy, he's near death. He's in the dungeon in Rome. He knows his head's going to be lopped off soon. In chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, he talks about a guy named Onesiphorus. And Onesiphorus had come to Rome, and Paul said he searched hard until he found me and brought such encouragement and refreshment to him. Maybe there's someone that you need to go find. They need your encouragement. They're in that dark time. They're in that dungeon. They're in that dark valley. And like Onesiphorus, you need to search. Search hard until you find them. And it might not be that, well, he had to search through the large city of Rome. Where is he at? Maybe it's not that you don't know where he lives or where he's at physically. But maybe you have to work your way through that person's depression or maybe through that person's anger or maybe through that person's excuses to find where they are and bring refreshment to them. Or in chapter 4, 2 Timothy, Paul writes, to Timothy says, come quickly. Come before winter. Come as soon as you can. He was humble enough to say, I need you. I'm in a dark place. And it would do so good to see your face. 
Can we be humble enough to make that known to a friend, to a brother or sister? I need you. Come quickly. Come as soon as you can. We're not the only believer, but also we are with our shepherd in that dark valley. He's with me there as well. David wrote, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And the shepherd is our peace, not our circumstances. The shepherd is there. I'm sure you've noticed before, you've heard it before, but in Psalm 23, when we get to this part about the dark valley, how the pronouns change. In the beginning it was, the Lord is my shepherd. He guides me. He leads me. But when we get to the dark valley, we get to to verse 4, it is you and your, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Because when we're in the dark valley, we don't want to just talk about the shepherd. We need to talk to the shepherd because he is our peace. Even with literal sheep out in the pasture, it's not the green grass or the quiet water that can make them relax. They can be in that setting and still be too nervous, be too anxious to really lay down and to eat and relax. It's the presence of the shepherd that gives them that peace. To know he's there, that he's watching over them. But we tend to focus on and look for the green, greener pastures, don't we? We're always looking for the greener pasture. For what's ahead. You know, when I finally graduate from high school, when I finally get out of college, when I finally get that job, when I finally have a family, when my family finally leaves, when I finally get to retirement, oh, then we'll get to the green grass, and then I'll have peace. But that's not, that's not it. It's not, it's not the quality of the grass and our pasture. It's the quality of our relationship with our shepherd that makes all the difference. And there's a lot of change in Psalm 23, from the quiet waters to the green pastures, the paths of righteousness, the dark valleys, the presence of the enemies, and the house of the Father, house of the Lord. And the one constant through all these changes is the shepherd who's with us. We're not alone in the dark valley. Other believers are there with us, but our shepherd is there with us as well. And you know You remember, Jesus knows darkness. He knows darkness. When Judas left the upper room that night of the Last Supper, as John wrote it in John chapter 13, he said, and it was night. He's not telling us that just that the sun had gone down. Spiritually, it was dark. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, and he could feel the descending darkness. He said, it's My soul is crushed almost to the point of death. When they came to arrest him in the Gospel of John, he said, this is your hour, the hour of darkness, when darkness reigns. It was dark. When he was on the cross, it was dark from noon to three. When he cried out, my father, my father, my my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The, The unimaginable darkness. Jesus knows darkness. John chapter one, verse five. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He knows darkness, and he overcomes darkness. And he did not forsake me, and he did not forsake you when he was in his darkness. Why would he forsake us when we're in our darkness? No. He's with us there in the dark valley. I'm a simple guy. Not the brightest, not the sharpest tool in the shed. And so I like things that are simple. When Bell was going to send me to the grocery store, I said, what do we need to get? And if it's five things or less, I'm all right. Right? Some milk, some eggs, some bread. You know, if it's more than five things, more of the fingers than I have on one hand, then I've got to write it down. I think about Psalm 23. There are some very powerful statements, truths here. And I'm thankful that they only have five words. It makes them easy to remember. Now, there's four of them we're going to talk about as we bring things to a close this morning. Four of them. But I've only got two hands. So I'm going to use my toes. And if you want to do that with me, you can, you can take your shoes off. You can leave your shoes on if you want. All right. And just imagine this. But I'm going to start counting on my toes. Because five things. I can remember five things. I can remember five words. More than that, I might have trouble. And it begins with this. I'm going to start with my left foot. I'm thinking about the toes there. And you're trying not to, but maybe you're thinking about it too. All right. The Lord is my shepherd. One, two, three, four, five. The Lord is my shepherd. And then the right foot. 
I have everything I need. I can remember that. You can remember that. That's important. Those things are powerful when you're going through the dark valley, especially. The Lord is my shepherd. One, two, three, four, five. I have everything I need. One, two, three, four, five. And then my left hand, the five fingers, I will fear no evil. My right hand, for you are with me. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. All right, let's do that again in our minds. Okay, think about it with me. I'm thinking about my left foot. Think about those toes that are there, all right? The Lord is my shepherd, right foot. I have everything I need. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And when I'm in the dark valley, this is the truth that I tell myself. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd. And as a good shepherd, he provides, I have, every, maybe not everything I want, but I have everything I need for that dark valley. And this is what I say to him. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And that's the foundation of the faith that we stand on. That left foot, the Lord is my shepherd. And that right foot, I have everything I need. That is the foundation of of my faith, that's where I can stand strong in the dark valley, and then the proclamation of my faith. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. In fact, if you would, you don't have to, but if you would, let's stand together. Let's do this together. I want us to think through this. I want us to, to work through this together. Let's stand together just for a moment. Think about that left foot and that right foot, that left hand and that right hand, the, the foundation of our faith. Put down that left foot and say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd, right foot. I have everything I need. Let's do that again. Left foot. The Lord is my shepherd. Right foot. I have everything I need. And what I proclaim, the, my faith by telling the left hand, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. One more time. I will fear no evil. For you are with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that we are not alone in the dark valleys. Lord, they come. And you've told us we should even be thankful for them because of, of you, the way you use them in our life. But it is a great comfort to know that we are not alone there in that dark valley. As our shepherd, you've given us everything that we need. We need fear nothing. Because you, you are with us. Help us to remember that. And continue to take one step, after a step, after a step. In obedience, in trust, in faith, as you lead us through the, through the valley of shadow of death, as you lead us in the paths of righteousness, for your name's sake, for your glory. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> We're going to be singing the song of decision. If you would like to pray with someone or talk with someone this morning, I'm sure one of the leaders here would be glad to talk with you this morning, or I would as well, if you'd like to let us know of your need while we sing.
loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Thank you all. You're dismissed.